Well, good morning and welcome to the worship service this morning. We're going to be prepare ourselves to sing Revive Us Again. And after we're through, we'll, we'll remain standing for prayer. So if you would please join in standing, singing Revive Us Again. So we're going to read some scripture this morning, and I'm going to go through a few announcements and prayer requests in the meantime. If you want to be turning to 1 Timothy 5, 1 Timothy 5, verses 17 through 22, um, I'll list a few prayer requests here before we read. Um, if we can remember Glenn Coates, uh, he's having some health issues that are preventing him from um, coming to church a lot lately, so please keep him up in prayer. Um, also, we want to uplift uh, Brenda Brigadoy's mom for um, grace and mercy there in this time of trial for the for millions and a number of other families that have lost uh, loved ones here in recent weeks. Uh, the Vermillions, the Haley's, uh, Broadman's, um, the Benjamins. And, um, and then also for Ross Shoup's father with the ankle injury, um, we pray for complete healing there. Um, also, if we want to uplift uh, Betty Bibbler's aunt, um, still in ICU. And then also we have upcoming elections. And then I'm missing one more. Uh, but if we could just uplift our nation and also the veterans today. So a um, lot of things to remember in prayer, but Lord, we uh, want to uplift those as well. So 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 22. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou, art not, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer today. Um, Lord, we lift up today to you. We lift up the upcoming week to you as we head into um, 
As we head into elections for this nation, we pray, Lord, for your hand of mercy, for your hand of grace. We pray, Lord, that most importantly that um, we as believers will uplift you and uplift our eyes to you, that we might turn in repentance as a nation. Lord, we know that putting faith in man uh, is dangerous. And Lord, we know that you are ultimately in control and sovereign. Um, we do pray, Lord, that you would lift up godly people to lead this country. Lord, there are many on our prayer request that we want to uplift. Uh, a lot of things going on here within our congregation. Um, we pray for Glenn Coates and his health issues. Give him the grace and mercy he needs. Um, we uplift Brenda Brigadoy um, and her mom. Uh, during this difficult time, we pray for the mercy and the grace that that whole family needs at this time. And then those who have recently lost loved ones, uh, including the Vermillions, the Haley's, the Broadman's, um, Steve Benjamin's family. And then uh, also, Lord, uh, we pray for healing for uh, Ra Shoup's dad as he is recovering from this severe ankle injury. We also pray, Lord, for um, Betty Bibler's aunt as she's still in ICU. And then, Lord, we do want to uplift our veterans on this day. We're so thankful for those who have been willing to um, put their lives on the line for uh, the freedoms that we can enjoy as a nation. And, Lord, I pray that you might continue to protect those freedoms that we have. Um, we thank you for those that did serve. We honor them today. We uplift them to you for blessing. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And uh, tell you what let's do this morning, and we do this, uh, we try to do it each year. But uh, we really want to show our appreciation for those who've served in our armed forces. So if you don't mind, if you've served in our armed forces, you should have received a corsage as you came in. If you would please stand and let us know where you served and which branch of the military that you served in. If you would please stand at this time. All right, Tom Evans just turned 90 this week. May we start with you, Tom? Would you tell us where you served? By the way, yeah, 90 years old is not bad. <laughs> Fort Campbell, Kentucky, amen. Uh, Air Force. Okay, Air Force. Bill? Uh, U.S. Army, uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay. Bob Freed. John Fromer. Uh, Ohio Army National Guard, 1964 to 70. Okay. Sam Bud. Fifth Marine, Vietnam. Wow. Don? Ohio National Guard, 1966 to 72. Okay. Mike? Uh, uh, United States Air Force, 1974 to 1991. Thank you. All right. Gerald? United States Army. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> David Markowski walked in. <laughs> David, where did you serve? Which branch of military? I was in the Army for nine years. I served in Korea and most of the Middle East. Okay. Again, thank you very much for your service. God bless America. Okay. All right, and of course, as Andy mentioned, on Thursday is uh, Veterans Day. I have a lengthy list of announcements here, so if you'll listen fast, I'll read this fast. How's that? Um, first of all, Christmas clothing and the gift drive is continuing. It's going to be this Friday at 9 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. If you know of someone who needs uh, clothing, please invite them to come. Donations can still be brought in. Place them in the room across from the toddler in the first and second grade classrooms. And if you have any questions, you may see Chris Russell or Christy Stewart. There's a donation box in the fellowship hall for the Finley City Missions. And if you have any questions regarding that, you can see Elena Moritz. She's doing a great job, as she usually does uh, with that uh, drive. And then there's Operation Christmas Child boxes. A lot of boxes around here. Just a few left due back on November the 20th. And I believe Sherry Wiseman is heading that one up.
November 15th is Generation Fellowship Thanksgiving meal. It's always a highlight over at the New Loves, and if you'd like to come, please RSVP to Amber as soon as possible, 1130, um, November 15th. And then there's a, on November the 20th, a special day. It's coming up here real soon, but there's an annual Thanksgiving offering. Half of that offering will go toward our missionaries and the ministries that our church uh, supports, and the other half will go toward our building fund. And uh, there's a congregational meeting after that service, after the morning service, to elect uh, this year's uh, next year's church leaders. And there is a list out on the table in the lobby for the 2023 uh, nominees. So if you would pick up one of those and maybe prayerfully consider that and uh, pray that God would continue to raising up godly leaders for our church. I'm glad to be in church this morning. Speaking of church, I was uh, keeping our grandchildren for most of the last couple of days and we had a blast. But Grandmom and Granddad are almost worn out this morning, okay? We're glad that uh, they hopped in their car and they left for Pennsylvania this morning, but it was a joy to be with the grandchildren. Nothing like it, right? But I'm glad to be with you this morning. All right, Pauline. Well, I'm going to ask that we stand and sing our worship songs this morning.
First Timothy chapter 5, and we transition from having talked about the widows in the previous paragraph to talking about the elders, those in leadership position in the local church. And just was trying to think through this, you know, Saul, who became Paul on the Damascus Highway, probably single-handedly was responsible for a lot of the women in the church that he's writing to at Ephesus for their being widows. Just think about that for a moment. In fact, he was on his way up to Damascus to kill more Christians, to drag them back and have them killed, when God arrested his attention and brought him wonderfully to himself in salvation. So maybe that explains why Paul gave so much emphasis in the first part of this chapter to the widows. But notice the transition in verse 17. Let the elders, the leaders that do their job well, be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who are laboring in word and doctrine. And it is Veterans Day on Thursday, so we want to properly honor them. But this verse talks about also honoring those in leadership. So we want to kind of walk through the passage and see how that unfolds. There was a, um, an email that went viral several years ago. What happened was a lady by the name of Samantha Brown walked into her local uh, Dunkin' Donut shop. And while she was in there doing whatever she was doing, she came out to her vehicle and she found this uh, envelope underneath her windshield wiper. So naturally she opened up the envelope and she found two $20 bills in it, along with this note attached to the $20 bills. And it said, I noticed the sticker on the back of your car, take your hero out to dinner when he comes home. Thank you both for serving. And it went on to say, thank him for being deployed and thank you for waiting for him. Well, she went online and she uh, contacted her boyfriend at that time who was serving in Afghanistan. And uh, they say that when he received uh, this notice that it brought tears to his eyes. And so he wrote back to... Uh, his girlfriend and said, uh, it's people like this who make me proud to be an American soldier. It's a little deed like that went a long, long way. But that captures the essence of this opening verse here, of this paragraph in verse 17 and following, where it says, we are to honor those to whom honor is appropriately due. Um, and sometimes uh, we take for granted our service men and women, but believe me, without what they're doing, even as I speak, we would not have the freedoms to do what we're doing here in this room. And it's been that way now for 246 years. So we're pausing on Thursday to honor our veterans, but we want to pause this morning and say, see, what does the Bible have to say about how to appropriately honor those who maybe serve behind the scenes? And, you know, we don't do it annually, maybe we should, but have the leaders stand up and uh, be recognized. But when we have a congregational meeting, usually you'll see them uh, and that sort of a thing. But i got to tell you from the bottom of my heart how grateful I am. This, this, this church functions every week because of people who are serving quietly behind the scenes and not drawing, getting attention drawn to themselves. I mean, if you just walk through on Wednesday night, KYB, for example, Sunday school, God is doing a great work around here in large part because of our leadership team. So what is our responsibility toward our leaders? Well, in the first couple of verses, it tells us clearly that our responsibility toward spiritual leadership at Bible Fellowship Church is, first of all, to be a quick to acknowledge what they're doing and to build them up, to affirm them. We've already read verse 17. Verse 18 goes on to say what the Scripture says, and it just basically reaches back to the book of Deuteronomy, pulls out one verse that's only used there in Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. But don't muzzle the ox that's treading out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his pay or his reward. So there's three things that we're to affirm our leadership team for. Number one is because of the way that they're ruling. Notice what the text says. Let the elders, the Greek word is presbyteros, the Presbyterian church is built on 
eldership rule. That's why it's called the Presbyterian Church. But that's what the word elders means. Those who are ruling over. Let the elders that rule well. Notice what the word rule is. They're in charge of superintending. Overseeing the operation of what goes on here at the local church. Now I want you to buckle your seatbelt. Because this is not a democracy. It is a theocracy, and we're going to see how the scripture deals with that in just a moment. But these particular rulers, it says, are doing what God's called them to do, and they're doing it beautifully. They're doing it in an excellent manner. Those individuals deserve our utmost respect and honor and value, okay? Again, I thank God for what he's doing here at Bible Fellowship Church in large measure. Because of what our pulpit committee does or our board does behind the scenes and no one ever sees it. But believe me, we're back there trying to seek God's will for the leadership of this church. Buckle your seatbelt. Everybody wants their opinion to count. I understand that. And it's worked well for about 246 years here in the United States of America. But I got to tell you, Tuesday is a crisis election. And I want to show you in just a minute what someone had to say about democracy. Democracy versus theocracy. That's what the New Testament teaches, and we want to unpackage some of that. Here is a gentleman, 1747 is when he was born, died in 1813. So that's been a few, a couple hundred years ago. But watch what he says. He was a Scottish judge, writer, historian, he was professor of history over at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He said, and I quote, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves a larges, which means generosity, funds from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury with the result that a democracy will always collapse over loose financial, physical policies, always followed by dictatorship. And he charts how this decline happens. He stated, I'm, I'm, this is again quoting, it says, the average age of the world's greatest civilization has been around 200 years. And again, our democracy, as I speak, is 246 years old. These nations have progressed through about eight different cycles here. The sequence goes like this. It starts with bondage and then spiritual faith. From spiritual faith to great courage. And you can see how the pilgrims went through this to begin with in our nation's history. From courage to liberty, liberty to abundance, abundance to selfishness, and from selfishness to apathy, and from apathy to dependence, and from dependence back into bondage. Does that remind you of any nation you know? And that cycle repeated itself in the book of Judges. We all like to think that we can just have our say, and our say goes at the local church. Buckle your seatbelt. Because the job of an elder is to be under the good hand of God and be sensitive to his leadership. And together, the elders make decisions for the local church. Which are, and our congregation, we pass it on to the congregation for final approval. But I just want to show you how important it is. this is to have absolute monarchy calling the shots at the local church. This is a democracy. You have your chance to do this on Tuesday down at the voting box. And by all means, please exercise your privilege in doing that. This is a crisis, crisis election, but I think I said that about the last election. God's ideal of government is a monarchy. What is a monarchy? The book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, 17, and 18 says that Christ is the head. He is the one who is preeminent. And in the local church in the book of Acts, they sought out leadership who was to be in contact with God, and God spoke to the spiritual leadership, which passed on what God said to them to the local congregation. So the Spirit is the executor. Again, this is Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Christ is the head. He is the one to have preeminence in the local church. But he works through leadership. Leadership is another way of saying God wants to not only protect his church, but he wants to provide direction for that church. And if you need a spiritual or a scriptural illustration of that, the one I can think of is out of the book of Acts chapter 20, 
Paul had been on three missionary journeys. He was in a real hurry when he came to Ephesus for the final time. He spent three years there as pastor. Think about that. The church we know most about in the New Testament is the church at Ephesus. Paul was pastor there for three years. He left Timothy in charge. On his third missionary journey, as he's winding it up, he's got to make a quick trip down to Jerusalem, be in time for Passover. But he stopped at a place called Miletus, just south of where he pastored. And there he summons, guess who? The Bible says he summoned for the elders of the church. He poured his heart out to them with tears in his eyes, and the elders were to pass that on to the congregation. God's form of government is he works through a team of spiritually filled men who are in touch with God. And those men make decisions and they bring it out to the congregation like we try to do around here. Say, what do you think about this? And we vote on it as a church. And so he says here, those men who are serving behind the scenes need to be properly honored for their rule, for their position. But not only for their rule, look at the text again, verse 17. Let them that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who are laboring in two things. The one is the word, and the other is doctrine. And you notice the word, not just work. The word goes a step above that. It's the word labor. Labor literally means pushing yourself to the point where physically, Sometimes mentally, you're just exhausted. If you do your job well, it can be absolutely exhausting. Studying the Word. I know sometimes we meet late at night. I know, look around the room, the men are just exhausted. They've had a full day at work, and now we're trying to hammer out decisions here at the local church. If you do your job right, it can be absolutely overwhelming and exhausting from time to time. And so he says the men that are ruling and are fulfilling their role well, they are to be commended. By the way, before I go on, I wanted to put this up here. There's no greater task in all the world. If I want to get tired and exhausted about something, I can't think of anything better to get exhausted about than digging into the Scripture and finding out what does God's Word have to say. Amen? So for their rule and for their role, but notice he's not finished yet. In verse 18, he says, don't forget they need to be rewarded for their service. So he says in verse 18, again, he pulls just one verse out of the Old Testament. That's the only time it's used, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. The scripture is clear, he says, and notice the analogy that he uses. You should not shut up, muzzle, plug up the ox who's doing the heavy lifting. The laborer is indeed worthy of his pay. Now, we live in northwest Ohio. No matter which side road you want to go down this time of the year, you'll see one of these machines out there doing the heavy lifting, right? Now, a farmer wouldn't think twice that something like that needs some either diesel or gasoline, however their, their operating capacity is, is designed, in order to continue doing the work. So it shouldn't be a big deal in the local church, he says, when I'm asking you to give those who are doing the heavy lifting, making the tough decisions, make sure that they're recognized. For the role that they're doing behind the scene, laboring to the point of exhaustion. So that's how he starts. Recognize them, approve them, affirm them um, for their responsibilities. But the next thing he talks about here, he takes a couple of verses to develop this, is you got to be very careful when you start accusing them. Make sure you do it the, the right way. Notice if you look at verse 19, this is a very strong word. Against an elder, do not entertain or receive and you see the word accusation there? That's a word that's used in a criminal court of law. Now, obviously, once in a while, they're going to need some correction. This is talking about when they really get out of line. So if an elder should get out of line, and by the way, I've been in churches before. When I was doing my internship in seminary, went to attended a church, a Baptist church, on Shallowford Road in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I actually saw this unfold where the uh, assistant pastor was involved in activity. It was highly questionable. And after a Sunday night setting, they dismissed all the non-members and had all the members stick around. And they put photographic evidence up on the big screen of some of his uh, involvement in activity that was illegal. 
And I remember sitting there in that uh, uh, meeting, watching that go down, and, and when the whole thing was over with, it struck terror into my own heart, making sure that things in my life were lined up the way they should be. So that's what's going on here. Be careful when it comes time to accusing them, but when they need to be accused, make sure you do it biblically. Against an elder, receive not a criminal charge, but before two or three witnesses. And it reminded me of the Old Testament. How many people in the Old Testament were criticized? You know, you, you can't be a father, you can't be a grandfather, you can't be in any kind of leadership capacity without expecting to be criticized once in a while. Can I get a witness? I remember Moses went to Pharaoh and simply did what God asked him to do. He said, uh, hey, God's told me to tell you, let my people go. Any questions about that? And God had to bring, what was it, ten plagues on Pharaoh before he unleashed his grip on God's people Israel. And Moses and the people of Israel finally were released. Pharaoh had a change of mind. And Pharaoh jumped in his chariot and chased off after them. Now Moses' back is literally up against the wall. There's a Red Sea behind him. He looks out in front of him and sees the dust kicking up. Here comes Pharaoh and his army. What are we to do? Watch how this goes down. When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they were so afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, Help! But then they cried out to Moses. <laughs> And they said, Moses, it's because of you bringing a criminal charge. There's 2.5 million of these people if you do the math. Not two or three witnesses, 2.5 million. And they're saying, Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in this wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? It had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. You know what Moses did at this point? He went right directly back to God and he says, God, what do we do? I know under your hand of guidance, you told me to tell Pharaoh. I told him what you asked me to tell him. Now my back is against the wall. People are complaining. They're bringing criminal charges against me. What do we do? And I'm telling you, if it's truly a leader under God's good hand of leadership, God will always make a way. God always works miracles. Because the next part of the story is this. Moses, what's that in your hand? Oh, this? This is a rod. Yeah, well, hold that thing up and let's see what happens. And he held that thing up. I'm telling you that there are going to be times if you're a true leader, your back will be up against the wall. And people will want to criticize and complain. Some might even want to bring criminal charges against you. But you, you mark it down. You go through the Old Testament and the New Testament. If a leader is a true spiritual leader under the hand of God, God will work miracles through that individual to accomplish his purposes. That's something, isn't it? So he says, look, with the elders in the church, your responsibility is to be quick to affirm them. Be careful when you accuse them. A simple protective rule, don't charge them unless there's two or three witnesses. At number two, there's a very serious public rebuke going on here. Them that do sin, like this assistant pastor I mentioned a moment ago, he was exposed before the whole congregation. His hand was caught in the till. And so they fired him that night. He never repented. You know what he did do? He got another job in Florida. You know what the rest of the story is? He was caught down there red-handed doing the very same thing. He never repented. So there are times when it's a very serious charge to bring someone in leadership position before the whole congregation. And when it's all said and done, if it's done scripturally, if it's done properly, and I've been through this a few times, it's not the idea of pointing how bad they are and how good you are. That's not the design of this. If it's done scripturally, it will strike terror into every single heart that we all need to sit up and pay attention and ask ourselves, is my house in order? Well, that's what's going on here. The third thing he asks us to do is not just to be quick to affirm them, to value them, to respect them, but to be careful when it comes to accusing them. But as he closes this paragraph, he says, look, you need to be diligent. And this is really where it should start when it comes time to accept them in leadership position. 
That's why every year we do in November, we take time to vote on the leadership team for the coming year. Recently, as a congregation, we just voted on a young man in Akron coming over here to be our, our family life pastor. That's a very serious vote. And I want you to know, before we ask Cameron to even consider coming here, we checked his background thoroughly, and particularly where he stands on scriptural doctrine. And I personally believe he's the man that God wants for this time in the history of our church. But notice what the scripture says about being diligent when it comes to voting on next year's coming leadership team or someone like a Cameron uh, Weichman who's going to come and serve with us at, at the beginning of January. Number one, it's a very sacred charge. Look at verse 21. I charge thee, and it's interesting to me to study this. It says, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ... And you would think that would be sufficient, but notice how it continues, the verse. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without being prejudiced, preferring one another. This is a very serious charge. It's so serious, he brought in two-thirds of the elect angels which didn't fall when uh, Satan, Lucifer, fell at the first uh, sin there before the throne of God. Here it is again. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without preferring one another, doing nothing by partiality. By the way, the elect, the word elect there is uh, ecclesia, is the word church. A church is a called out group of people who are following God. Like the children of Israel came out of Egypt. It's an Old Testament, Testament picture of what's happening now. We've been called out of darkness to follow God. So the word elect there, don't let it throw you. It's, it's basically you're elect of God if you're a born-again Christian. But they're chosen of God. They're elect of God. And I think what the Holy Spirit wants us to see in this particular part of the paragraph is that currently the church is in enemy territory. We're under constant attack from his host. One-third of the angels fell with Lucifer, but two-thirds did not. I want you to know before every... Sunday morning, a group of us get together and we pray. And part of our prayer is for God's protection on these premises for his church. Protect Sunday school and protect the morning worship service. Take care of even the smallest distractions because Satan is constantly working, wanting to distract you from the truth of his word because he knows if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. We are in enemy territory. But God has chosen through his son, Jesus Christ, and the elect angels. He says, you do nothing, that, that you observe these things, rather, without preferring one another, doing nothing by partiality. Just went through the scriptures this week, looking and refreshing my own heart with what the Bible says about the elect angels. First of all, they're messengers. And by the way, they're doing what God's called you to do if you're his elect, if you're his child this morning. You're to be God's messengers. That's what they're doing. That's what the word angel means. They're messengers. They go back and forth before the throne of God, uh, taking messages to God's people through the Old Testament. They served as, and New Testament too, they served as mighty warriors. Remember, uh, who was it? Hezekiah cried out to God in one night. He sent one angel and killed 185,000 of the enemy. They're mighty, mighty warriors. They administer God's judgment when that becomes necessary. They're all over the book of Revelation. They minister to God's people. Maybe you've been ministered to by an angel and you didn't even know it, according to the book of Hebrews. Uh, keenly interested in the redemptive purposes of God. This is one that's been working on me in recent days. You know, there's not a handbook in, up in heaven for the angels to read what God's going to do there on planet Earth. But they're keenly watching believers, followers of Jesus Christ, and they're putting the piece of puzzle together that God is up to something great. He created the angels, but he also created human beings. And the difference between us and the angels is that we can have that eternal relationship with the Lord. That's why God sent his only begotten son to die on that cross so we could have this privilege. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 says, The angels are earnestly desiring to peer into, to observe, to look into what God is doing. Even in this congregation this morning, the angels are in, in, intensely interested in what God is up to and his, as his redemption is unfolding. 
So there is a sacred charge. He calls in the elect angels. But there are some sobering commands that he comes down on top of this with. Notice that with me in verse 22. There are three actual commands here, imperatives. Paul is telling Timothy that when it comes time for electing leadership in the local church, not to lay hands quickly on any man. That's command number one. The second imperative command, he says, is don't be partaker of other men's sins. Do you know if you just glibly hire somebody or glibly ask someone to serve in leadership at the local church, you can actually be engaging in that individual's sin? You're a partaker of other men's sins. And then he says, I want you to keep yourself chaste, keep yourself pure. In other words, Paul is telling Timothy, this is very serious. Don't lay hands suddenly. Don't just be quick to ask someone to come and serve. Check their track record. Or is that individual truly following Jesus Christ? Do they have biblical character and standards? Do they have convictions? And are they keeping themselves chaste and clean, uh, clean before the Lord? Highly, highly important. So in the middle of all this, some people like to reach into this and take it and use it for their own personal interests. But notice the context here. Leadership's not always easy. Just ask Moses. Just ask Aaron. Sometimes leadership is overwhelming. So tucked in the middle of all this, I want you to see it for yourself. He says, Timothy, evidently Timothy had... Uh, trouble with uh, st his stomach, medical problems, and uh, he needed some medicine from time to time. And so Paul said to Timothy in verse 23, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake, medical purposes, and your often frequent infirmities. Paul was writing to a young man, he must have had, uh, maybe he had trouble with worry, anxiety attacks. And so to calm him down, Paul said, hey, let's be very practical here. Drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. A little simple cure. And finally, not only a sacred charge, sobering commands, but a very simple cure. Some very serious considerations as this paragraph concludes. He says, now, Timothy, think about this. When it comes to electing leadership in the local church, verse 24, some men's sins are just obvious, open, and they're evident beforehand as they're marching on to judgment and he goes on to say and some men they follow after maybe they're not so obvious but nevertheless they're there and sooner or later they're going to be found out likewise there are people Timothy who are down in the trenches who have character and conviction they're actually doing the work you look for those men maybe their uh, good works are not as easy to spot Easy to see, but nevertheless, they're there. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest before him, and they that are otherwise, they can't be hid. You say, what in the world is this all about? I'm trying to piece this all together. I think what he's saying to young Timothy is be diligent to select people who are rock solid in the faith. Don't just, uh, you know, think, well, so-and-so, maybe if we ask him to serve, maybe he would become a better Christian. It's not like that. You should be finding someone who's already solid in the scriptures, who has scriptural conviction, and who's ready, ready and willing to do the work. He's saying be diligent to select people who are rock solid in the faith because through, though sin may be hidden for just a little while, though their virtue may go unobserved, unnoticed, in the end, it's eventually going to come out, as it always will. So, Timothy, be careful, would you? Now, look, this is Communion Sunday, and I thought, how in the world can we bring this down to where all of us live? I mean, yes, the context is directed to leadership, but as I always say when we talk about leadership, we're talking about dads, moms, grandmoms, granddads, people down at work. If you're a manager, if you own a business, and leadership here at the Bible Fellowship Church, here are some things to consider as we come to this communion table. I want to ask you to ask yourself, am I doing this as a spiritual leader under the good hand and direction of God? Number one, am I genuinely committed? Not that I'm perfect. You hold a magnifying glass up to my life, I'm not perfect. But God knows deep down on the inside of my heart, I really want to please him. I really want to know him. I really want to follow him. Are you committed that way? Number two, 
Am I demonstrating godly character in every area of my life? I don't just turn it on here at church. But when I walk out those doors and through the week, my neighbors, people I work with, maybe if I'm going to school, they see godly character in my life. Here's an important one. I find that this either makes or breaks an individual. Do you have a teachable spirit? Are you approachable? Can somebody approach you and talk to you about an issue without you getting sideways with that individual? Very important character quality in a true leader. Am I flexible? Am I willing to change if it's scriptural? Am I team-oriented or am I in this just to draw attention to myself? These are great character qualities for a leader. Am I leading by example? And finally, do I have a heart that really wants to serve? The opening verse here is altogether important. Let the leadership who's ruling well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who are laboring in word and doctrine. Let's pray, shall we? With our heads bowed, our eyes are closed. I wonder, do you really know the Lord as your personal Savior this morning? Have you surrendered your life to him? Moses was growing up in Pharaoh's house as an infant. He could have chosen to live that lifestyle. He could have chosen to go to the finest schools and be the next Pharaoh of all of Egypt. But he had to make a choice. And thankfully, he chose to turn his back on that lifestyle. And he chose rather to suffer with the people of God. So he repented. He gave his heart and life to God. And he set out to follow him. That cost him dearly. You remember the story. He had to go out into the desert. and There he was there for 40 years before God spoke to him again and said, Moses, you're my man. And I'm going to use you with all your weaknesses to lead my people. And through you, I'm going to display my power over and over and over again. My question to you this morning, do you really know the Lord is your Savior? If you've never repented of your sin, turn from that sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone. This would be a good opportunity to start following Jesus. Won't you come and give your heart to Him? But as you know, this paragraph, this book is written for believers in a local church who are interested in genuinely wanting to follow God. And this particular paragraph highlights how... I can display my gratitude toward those who are in leadership position. If God's spoken to your heart, maybe you're a leader here at the church. And there are some decisions you need to make before we come to the communion table this morning. Won't you make those decisions? Father, thank you so much for your word to us this morning. I thank you once again how refreshing and how relevant your word is here in, in 2022. It's just as relevant as it was in the first century when this was penned by Paul under the hand of the Holy Spirit to give to Timothy. I pray that you would cause this church to reflect the biblical principles that we're finding throughout Scripture, especially in the book of 1 Timothy, and help us to submit ourselves to your lordship and your authority. I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation before we come to the communion table. Won't you sing with me? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, know my thoughts, I
be seated. I want to read from Colossians uh, chapter 1, verses 16, 17, and 18. Uh, listen to what the scripture says about Jesus being in charge of his church. Verse 15 says, he is the image of the invisible God, the exact likeness, because Jesus is God. He's the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created. Now, that's a mouthful. Think about that. In the beginning, God created, Genesis 1-1. And this says it was by Jesus Christ. Of course, we know the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, because the word God is Elohim, the word for the great three in one. But by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, whether they're visible or invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, just various orders and ranks of authority, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and listen to this, by him all things are being held together. Scientists are wondering how the atom can hold together the way it does. Well, we know how it's held together, right? According to the book of Peter, one day God's just going to let it all go. It's going to dissolve. But this just tells us how great God is. But verse 18 comes down on top of it and says, He is before all things, by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that in all things, all things, all things, he might have preeminence. That's a long word that means first place. Who's in control at Bible Fellowship Church? God is. And we're coming this morning to pause and do this in remembrance of him. So, Father, thank you so much for your word to us. You've not left us in the dark. But years and years ago, you give us classic examples of men like Moses. He's about as backward as they come. But you chose him for a special purpose. And you raised him up to show your power through his leadership. And because of his anger, he didn't make it into the promised land. Joshua had to pick up the baton and carry God's people to the promised land. But nevertheless, there's a principle there that God, for whatever reason, you choose to work here at your church under the good hand of God, your son Jesus, through leaders. And we just want to thank you for them this morning and pray we can properly honor them as your word asks us to. But ultimately, we're here to remember Jesus Christ. And we want to pause and thank you, Lord Jesus, for the way that you loved us so much that you came into this very dark earth and you took the lowest position possible. You were born in a manger and you just kept going lower and lower and lower by humbling yourself and serving people, not to be served, but serving. And then the Bible says you took the ultimate place, the ultimate act was being crucified on a Roman execution rack and lifted up, your blood was shed so that we might experience the cleansing and forgiveness of sin. We're here just to say thank you once again, new and afresh. And we praise you that that's not the end of the story, but just before you went to the cross, you told your disciples, I'm going to eat this afresh with you in my Father's kingdom. You rose from the grave, and we look forward to that day where we will be reunited with you, and we will eat this with you personally forevermore. So, Father, we just want to say thank you for being in charge here at Bible Fellowship Church. Thank you for the veterans the military who are in uniform today, protecting our country so we can have this privilege. And we thank you for the spiritual leaders that you're using to accomplish your purposes here in Arlington, Ohio, through Bible Fellowship Church. Thank you for this bread we're about to receive, where it reminds us of the tremendous price that was paid so we could have this, this time together to remember you. So please come and bless it in Jesus' name. Amen.